The automobile is an icon of personal freedom that we Americans cherish, but the cost of that freedom can be exorbitant. In 1990, 122 men, women, and children died every day in traffic crashes. Another 1,000 suffered injuries, requiring hospitalization each day. By year's end, nearly 45,000 lives were lost, almost as many as in 10 years of war in Vietnam. Aside from the immeasurable human toll, Americans bore the brunt of over $70 billion in financial cost. Now, if you drive your car every day, chances are good that you'll encounter a serious motor vehicle accident sooner or later. But you can improve your odds of surviving by using the passenger restraint system in your car. When we think of a car crash, most of us imagine it as one big impact, nothing more. But there are actually three types of collisions. Let's go over them. The car's collision, the human collision, and the collision of the internal organs within the human body. The first type, the car's collision, is self-explanatory. The car buckles and bends as it hits an object and comes to an abrupt stop. The second type of collision, the human collision, is where the injuries are sustained. As the car collides, the unbelted occupant is still moving at the vehicle's original speed. The occupant is now free to strike any of the objects inside the car, most notably the steering wheel or windshield. Of course, the chances of striking a fellow occupant are also high. Many times, passengers in the back seat become human projectiles striking or even killing front seat occupants. The last type of collision is internal. Even after the body stops moving in a crash, the internal organs have yet to meet their collision with the skeletal system. For instance, as the body hurls forward, the brain slams into the front of the skull, often resulting in permanent damage. Now, if you think you can brace yourself from a crash unprotected, you are wrong. At 35 miles per hour, an unbelted passenger weighing 180 pounds would slam into the dashboard with a force greater than 3,600 pounds. Try stopping yourself from that. With this in mind, safety belts just make good sense. The belted occupant is allowed to meet a more gradual stop after a crash. You stop as the car stops. This allows you to ride down the crash. The unbelted occupant stops after the car stops. Think about it. The safety belt distributes the forces of rapid deceleration over larger and stronger parts of your body, such as the chest, hips, and shoulders. And of course, the safety belt holds you in place as the car buckles and bends around you. The benefits of the safety belt also apply to the airbag. An important distinction to make, though, is that airbags are designed to supplement the seat belt. They should not be used as the only form of protection. The airbag is a porous fabric bag packed into the steering wheel or dashboard of a car. It's designed to inflate after a serious frontal crash within one-tenth of a second after impact. Within two-tenths of a second, the bag begins to deflate. The entire process is over in less than one second. Now, child safety seats are another matter entirely. Because of size, the child needs special protection. Child safety seats could prevent 53,000 injuries a year, but they must be used correctly. Never sacrifice safety for comfort. You know, almost half of the fatalities and serious injuries suffered by unbelted passengers could be prevented by wearing safety belts. In other words, just wearing a safety belt reduces the chances of being killed or injured in a crash by half. And airbags used in conjunction with belts can provide even greater odds. Many people suffer or even die unnecessarily because they don't take a second to buckle up.
as a patrol officer, your squad car is your office. You practically live in it. Eight hours a day, day in, day out, in good weather or bad weather, you're out there patrolling the streets, the same streets that hold such high risk for the average driver. So you'd think it would be a good bet that safety belt compliance would be 100% among officers. Wrong. <laughs> Police give many excuses for not wearing their belts. Among the top 10 excuses given, belts catch on the badges, they trap the officer, they scratch holster leather, and they limit the officer's ability to exit the vehicle quickly. But these excuses pale in comparison with the fact that police officers are up to 10 times as likely to be involved in a crash as the average driver. Not to mention that the inside of the officer's patrol car is much different than the average driver's car. The officer has got to deal with a computer console, a video camera, and many other items. If an officer is belted in, he avoids slamming into these extra obstacles. Now consider the issue of pursuit driving. Certainly this is a very hazardous situation for any officer. Now imagine initiating pursuit unbelted. At the high speeds attained in pursuits such as these, any sort of a collision would most certainly be deadly because of the theory of the crash force. Sir Isaac Newton explained it this way, an object in motion continues to remain in motion at the original speed until acted upon by an outside force. In other words, something keeps moving in the direction it was headed until it is stopped. Now that something is probably your head. The stopping force is probably the dashboard. Consider that at 35 miles per hour, an unrestrained occupant weighing around 180 pounds would hit the interior of the car with a force of 3,600 pounds. In a pursuit situation, the speeds are much faster, the crash force is much greater, and the outcome even more deadly. Here's another statistic for you. On the average, officers can expect to be involved in a crash every 28,000 miles of driving. With as much driving as the job entails, the odds are not in your favor. In a one-time study conducted by the IACP, it was found that nearly one out of five crashes include personal injury or fatalities to officers, and that an average of 23 working days is lost per injury producing crash. Now, I don't think many of us could afford to lose that kind of time, and it's so unnecessary. Buckling up takes about one second, one second. Is saving one second so important that you'd be willing to miss an average of 23 working days for recovery or be willing to risk your life and your family's future? The benefits of the safety belt are so clear. They reduce officer contact with the vehicle interior and other occupants. They prevent ejections that allow officers to stop as the car stops. This is called the ride down effect. Belts slowly bring occupants to a stop reducing the massive forces experienced during rapid deceleration. Safety belts spread the stopping force widely across the body's strong points, the hips, chest, and shoulders. And of course, safety belts help officers maintain control of their vehicle. Even after an initial impact, if you're belted, you can still control your car and avoid potential fatal secondary crashes. That improves your chances of survival as well as other drivers at the scene. All in all, the safety belt provides a lot of benefit for one second of your time. Buckle up. Did you know that nearly every state in the Union has a safety belt law? And did you also know that surveys in recent years show that most Americans believe in safety belts and child safety seats? But there are still quite a few Americans who don't buckle up. <laughs> Studies have shown that many Americans need some kind of law before they will do the safe thing and buckle up. 
Studies have also shown that many Americans need their safety belt laws enforced. So why aren't these laws being enforced? Well, there are many excuses given. Many officers feel quite simply that there should not be a law requiring people to use their safety belts. They feel that they have more important things to do than cite people for not buckling up. But enforcing seatbelt laws is about saving lives. I just feel that uh, we do have a responsibility to the public uh, on the seatbelt violations. Uh, if I figure that uh, with the tickets that I write, if it does save one life a year down the road, six months down the road, that uh, out of all the tickets I write, that one life will be worth all of it. In 1990, safety belts saved approximately 4,800 lives and prevented around 125,000 moderate to critical injuries. What could be more important than saving lives? Isn't part of the officer's creed to protect the public? It is important to enforce the laws, and it does matter, but several enforcement strategies are needed first. Routine patrol is the easiest means of spotting non-usage of seatbelts. The majority of states have seatbelt laws that are secondary. Now, this doesn't make the law unenforceable. Many agencies are successfully using a strategy called integrated enforcement which simply means that enforcement of the seatbelt law is part of the officer's routine traffic activities. Belts are made a part of every traffic contact. For the majority of the public, the only contact they have with the law enforcement community is when they are stopped for a traffic infraction. This is an unusual event for them, and they vividly remember details of the incident, making the traffic stop an excellent time to mention the importance of safety belts. If the motorist stopped for another violation is belted, recognize that and thank them. If the motorist is not belted, appropriate enforcement action can be taken. Another successful strategy is a one or two week enforcement blitz. Often used around holiday periods, the blitz incorporates intense publicity about the life-saving benefits of belts and concentrated enforcement of safety belt laws. Excellent increases in use rates have been obtained when blitz activities have been combined with ongoing integrated enforcement. It does seem as if the public responds to the enforcement effort. If the police cite or warn few people about safety belts, then the law will be seen as having no teeth. Usage rates will drop. On the other hand, when violators are routinely cited and when that fact is publicized, usage rates will rise. Don't forget, that the more people comply with the law, the more they will form the habit of buckling up. To prove the point, let's look at New York State, which was the first state to pass a mandatory seatbelt law. When that law went into effect, belt use increased sharply. For instance, in Elmira, New York, belt use had been at around 14% before the law and jumped to 62% during that first month that it was enforced. But after three months, the public perceived no enforcement and usage rates slumped. The police then initiated an enforcement blitz and usage soared to 77%. The message from this is pretty clear. Even though Americans perceive seatbelt laws as good, they need a little push before they'll buckle up. And they need that push from the very people that are seen as role models, police officers. Safety belts save lives when the laws are aggressively enforced. It's as simple as that. And what's more important for law enforcement than saving lives? I would really hate to have to deliver a message to someone when I know that I saw that person yesterday and it may have been possible for me to save their life by issuing them a citation yesterday for not wearing a seatbelt. And because normally when you cite them for not wearing a seatbelt, they'll wear that seatbelt the next time they get in the car. The seatbelt citation is a reminder to put that seatbelt on. Undoubtedly, enforcement is a key. You can have all the public awareness programs you want, but nothing will make a person think about buckling up every time he or she gets in a car, like being involved in an accident or getting a ticket.
traffic crashes are the number one killer of Americans between the ages of 6 and 32. Now that's a frightening statistic and it's especially disturbing for all you officers out there who spend so much of your time behind the wheel of a car. The good news is that the overall rate of traffic deaths is down this year. And one of the main reasons is that more and more of us are using seatbelts. Now we spoke with the FOP President Dewey Stokes recently about his support of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's Operation Buckle Down. Well, we're interested in the whole gauntlet of officer safety, but we became involved in the buckle down program about a year ago when the administrator Curry uh, started the program to, at the direction of the president, to get 70 percent of the public wearing their seat belts. Well, when we reviewed accidents that officers involved in and why, I think it's a great program for law enforcement to be concerned about and become deeply involved in. And a lot of the police departments throughout the country are involved in the buckle down program and encouraging officers to use their seat belts. Now you brought some pictures with you and some video, some amazing pictures that I want to show and as we see these I want you to talk about what we're seeing. Tell us what we're seeing now and talk about well, I that. I think here now you're seeing the inside of a typical modern day cruiser. Uh, and as you can see, it's not the front seat of the typical family car. Uh, you'll see the computers, the shotgun racks, the videos, the uh, microphones, uh, uh, the radio transmitters, uh, and other equipment that the officers use. And what they actually are uh, when they break loose or the officer breaks loose and moves around in the cruiser, he or she then becomes uh, guided into those what we call interior missiles. They can slide into the shotgun rack, into the VCR camera, or into the computer, and consequently uh, induce uh, physical harm to the officers. Now, common sense says officers in the vehicle a lot, so they're going to be involved in a lot more traffic accidents than the average citizen. Do you, what kind of statistics, what kind of figures out there concerning officers' deaths and accidents? Law enforcement officers drive in all types of conditions and at all types of peak and off-peak time. And then, of course, we're involved in a lot of hazardous situations where we're in pursuit of vehicles, in pursuit of uh, those individuals that violate the law. So those uh, cases, we're concerned about the officers learning pursuit driving. When you come back inside the car, we're interested in the safety of the officer at that point also. And we have some video that I want to show, and this deals with the importance of maintaining control of the vehicle. And so as we see this video, I want you to talk through what we're seeing, because it starts out with the officer putting on the seat belt and going mm. through uh, an obstacle course, so to speak. So tell us what we're seeing. What you're seeing here is the sergeant at Topeka, Kansas, uh, who's demonstrating for us uh, buckle down, how he buckles down inside the cruiser, and the control that he maintained over this cruiser as he drives through this obstacle course. And you can see here, He's pretty stable. He's done this at the same mile per hour that he will in a subsequent uh, sequence that you'll see in just a second. Now here he is in the slalom, slalom uh, maneuver without his seat belt on. As you'll notice when he gets in the car, he does not buckle the seat belt. And you might note the, the time it took to button the seat belt versus not buckling. Here he goes through the uh, cones and how you can see him moving back and forth trying to maintain control. Here you'll see that the officer is completely on the passenger side of the vehicle there at that last frame where he has slid across the seat. Now inside if he's buckled down he's not sliding across the street seat he's maintaining control of the vehicle. Here he slid across the seat. He could hit the, the shotgun rack he could hit the VCR, he could hit other missiles that broke loose such as a clipboard, a microphone, or the computer deck in, inside the cruiser. So these are all dangerous to the officers. It's going to inflict injury to the officer, going to cause mark off, injury mark off, and etc. Almost 50% of the officers out there aren't wearing their, their seat belts and, and certainly aren't wearing their vest either. But mm -hmm. give a final message to officers about safety. Buckle down. Buckling down takes you about a second to get in, a second to get out of that belt. That belt's not going to jam and prevent you from exiting the cruiser to do your job. We believe also when you're looking at the purchase of cars, uh, look to the airbags. We see what airbags will do, but right now, 99% of our cruisers have the ability to buckle down, and I'd encourage you for the, your sake 
and the sake of your family. And I don't want to see your name on our wall in Washington, D.C. at our memorial, joining the other 12,561 officers that are already there.